Given the market rise of the past couple of years, I think it's pertinent to start by asking the question, well, why invest in Japan at this point, or rather, why stick with Japan at this point? And I'm going to offer you a cyclical reason, I'm going to offer you a structural reason, and I'm going to offer you a geopolitical reason to remain engaged with the Japanese market. First, the cyclical reason. The chart on the left here shows unemployment in Japan, and actually, as of last week, the, the latest data point came out and unemployment in Japan is 3.3%. Now, this is an employment level that most countries in the world would kill for. Japan is approaching full employment. And that's very significant because more households are now uh, earning an income. Workers have more bargaining power with their employers. And so there is scope for wages to go up. And that is very significant because, as you can see on the right, looking at the blue line, Japanese workers haven't seen their wages go up for nearly 20 years. On only three occasions in the last 16 years have nominal wages gone up by more than 1% year on year. And most of the time, they're down year on year. So this is a, a large economy in which the received wisdom across the whole workforce now is that people never earn more. Now, with unemployment at 3.3%, it becomes entirely feasible that people will start to earn more. And that's significant, of course, because it'll feed through into a more inflationary environment, which is necessary to take Japan out of the 20-year doldrums that it's been in. On to the structural reason to be positive on Japan. When Prime Minister Abe got re-elected in 2012, he made some very bold promises about how quickly he would change things in Japan. And I think people took him at his word, and I think they've been a little bit disappointed. But of course, Prime Minister Abe is a politician, and his job is to tell people good stories about what he will achieve, and the reality often lags what he promised, uh, as is the case everywhere. And over time, however, there have been steps for structural reform. And one of them is in corporate governance. Japanese companies famously haven't been taking as much care of minority equity investors as you would hope for a long time now. And the government has made some very useful steps to start the process of getting companies thinking about the need for higher returns and equity, for greater use of independent directors, for improved disclosure, and so on. It's significant that this pressure is coming from within Japan. Because when foreigners go to Japan and agitate for change, the louder they shout, the more counterproductive it is. Whereas when the, when, the, when the impetus comes from within Japan, there is nothing to push back against. Japan Inc. is telling Japan Inc. what to do. And this is very powerful. So companies will go out of their way now to avoid the embarrassment of having to explain why they haven't complied with the government's wishes. For equity investors, this is important because returns on equity in Japan have been too low for too long. And this is one reason that price to book has been low. Valuations should be low because returns have been low. And with the, the tailwind from the government, return on equity, as you can see on the left, is approaching all-time highs. And payouts to equity investors, as you can see on the right, are also approaching long-term highs. So for all of the reputation that Japanese companies have for not looking after equity investors, they are buying back more shares now and paying higher dividends. Although it's been very easy for Westerners to criticize Japanese companies for how lazy their balance sheets are and for the amount of cash they've had on balance sheets, to a large extent, in a deflationary environment, these have been logical responses. When there is persistent deflation, any amount of money on your, on your balance sheet this year will be worth more next year. And so it's sensible to hoard cash. It's not financially illogical. However, with the pressure from the government to raise returns on equity, which requires utilizing balance sheets more efficiently, and with the prospect of a return to inflation, it will be equally as logical for Japanese companies to start using their cash 
to start investing again and for individuals maybe to redeploy capital from low risk assets to riskier assets such as equities. Again, this is something that we should be positive about. And I will move on to the geopolitical reason to be positive about Japan. And on first take, this might sound counterintuitive, but the rise of China in the region as an increasingly assertive force is a reason to feel positive about Japan. And I say that because Japan in isolation, on its own, is sufficiently wealthy that the status quo can sustain for another couple of decades. But the status quo in Japan, of course, is precisely what we don't want. We want change, and we want reform, we want improvement, we want growth. China has gone from being the, the manufacturer of the world to being a more assertive geopolitical presence in the region. And this makes Japan and other countries feel somewhat insecure. And so Japanese politicians can use the prospect of a more aggressive China as a tool to get things done with their domestic lobby. China equally can use its own external relations as a means of releasing pressure uh, with its populace. And I think this will not change for many, many years. So Japan will have to coalesce and change in opposition to a more assertive China. There could be accidents, but I don't think there'll be conflict. And this, again, is good for Japan. Over the last two or three decades, the body of knowledge about Japan has dissipated. Fewer people have looked at the asset class. It hasn't been a fashionable asset class. It's much harder to get people's attention with a speech on Japan than it is with one on, say, emerging markets. And so many people use some of their old preconceptions about Japan as an ongoing excuse not to invest in Japan. People believe that Japanese companies' competitiveness is long gone. And they say this on the basis of the fact that their television now is Korean. But Japan has many world-leading companies under the radar screen in areas such as medical technology or advanced materials or factory automation. And if and as corporate Japan gets more aggressive, they will monetize this technology more. We will hear more about it. Japan's demographics are a challenge, but demographics play out over a long, long time period. And in the meantime, there's much that Japan can do to improve its productivity to more than offset the demographic challenges. The fiscal deficit is probably the biggest risk that Japan faces, in my opinion. But the deficit has expanded due to the lack of growth in Japan. If Japan can return to growth, then tax revenues will go up. And if tax revenues go up, the fiscal deficit will narrow, and what feels like a very substantial problem now will become a lesser issue in the future. For people who think that the third arrow around structural reform isn't working, I would point them to what I said about corporate governance, because there are many positive changes there. They're just not always visible from overseas. As a result, returns are going up, and then the, the crucial question, as ever, to ask yourselves is what are we being asked to pay for this story? What do valuations look like? When I began my career a little while ago, Japanese valuations were impossible. And many people continue to think that Japanese valuations look expensive. But it's no longer the case, particularly in an environment of rising returns. You can see on the top left that the price to earnings multiple has come down substantially over time. The price to book multiple has got cheaper over time. And you can justify an increase due to the higher return on equity that Japan is enjoying. Many people think that Japan lags behind Europe with respect to returns, for example, or the US with respect to dividend yield. But you can see from the table at the bottom that this is not the case. Return on equity in Japan is very close to that in Europe. The dividend yield in Japan is the same as that in the US. Many investors don't fully really appreciate this yet. And 
I met someone earlier this week who said, well, of course, we never have to invest in Japan because it's always underperformed, which is a very counterintuitive way to think about the price of anything, really. The cheaper something gets, the better the reason to invest in it. And Japan has underperformed since the peak of the bubble. But in an era of, uh, of, of reform, in a period in which Japan needs to, needs to grow in order to retain its geopolitical relevance within Asia, and with a stock market which is, um, which is really fairly good value, underperformance represents opportunity.